Let's begin with a word of prayer. Welcome, by the way, to the 10 o'clock, 10.01 service at the Union Church starting a minute early today. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on live stream from, there's the baby, see, I'm telling the truth. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on live stream from wherever you are in various places, towns, or states different than our own. Welcome. God is wherever you are also. So thank you for joining us for worship. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather in this place today. Thank you for your great love. Thank you that you know our names. You know everything about us. And we need never be overcome by shame because you have given your son who gave his life on the cross so our sin is forgiven. Thank you for your grace. Receive our worship today and lead this service. By your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So some quick announcements to share with you. The first one won't be on the wall, but um, Ted and Maxine, longtime attendees of Union Church, are now living at a facility in the center of Attleboro, and if anyone, just once a month, I'd love to have them come and join us at church. I've had one person step forward and say they would help with rides. If you're able to help with that, please see me. Also on Saturday, June 1st, beginning at noon, we have an artist, Casey Wirth, who will be leading us through painting a field of flowers. If one of your on your bucket list is painting Flowers, this is the event for you. And sign up quickly because there's a limit of 15 for this event. That's June 1st. On June 9, Renee's brother Eric, who's a friend of mine also, will be here. He is a financial fraud <laughs> investigator. Can you people behave over there, really? Eric is a financial fraud investigator. We have another one, actually, investigator in, an insurance investigator in our church. But he is coming to speak on scams, which ties in with the sermon today. But scams come through emails, text messages, and other, fra other um, avenues. So that is June 9, following this service at 11.30 a.m., there's also a sign up on the website if you need help signing up, leave a message on the church answering machine and we will help you get signed up. But that is going to be very interesting on financial fraud. Our annual meeting is May 20 at 7 p.m. We discuss exciting things like the church budget for the next year and the appointment of officers. There are minor changes to the bylaws. If you're sitting in your seat very eager to see those changes, there's a print right out on the welcome desk that you can get a copy of to see, and all are welcome at that meeting. The Apostle Paul said, do not forsake the public reading of scripture. Pastor Stephen has begun leading us through a reading of the book of Luke, so he's gonna come up and do that for us. Good morning. We're continuing our read through of Luke's account of the gospel, uh, starting Luke 3, 1 through 20. It is page 726 in the Bibles in front of you if you want to follow along. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of, of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria, and Traconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word went into the con the word of God came to the son of Ze John, came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, 
the way is smooth, and all the people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share one with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John had rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Now, if you would stand and join us for worship. The Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever
Saturday, May 11 at 6.30 p.m. You saw it on the wall anyway, but at 6.30 p.m. you're invited to a special worship, worship concert entitled Yesterday, Today, and Forever, led by our worship team. So that's Saturday at 6.30. There'll be a range of music because we have all different ways of worshiping. So that's going to be a great event. Saturday, May 11 at 6.30 you are invited. 
As we go to prayer this morning, I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 11, and this is the passage read by Jesus in the synagogue at Nazareth when he was announcing that he was the fulfillment of this passage, the Messiah appointed by God. And then we'll pray for some of our ongoing prayer requests, and we have, we, we have quite a few. Isaiah 61, beginning at verse 1, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for, of our God, to provide to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Heavenly Father, thank you that we may gather in this place today. Thank you that the scripture teaches us that wherever two or more are gathered, you are present also. Thank you that we can come together, you individually, during the week and bring our requests before you. Thank you that we may come together corporately in worship to bring our requests of our church family before you. Thank you, Father, that you are wiser than we are, more generous than any human being, kinder than any person. Thank you, Father, that you hear us when we pray and you know all things about us. And we can always come to you. So we worship you, we thank you, we give you our praise today. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that Stacy Barton's husband, Steve, has come through his eye surgery and is doing well. We give you thanks and pray that his eyesight will be completely restored with no further difficulty. We pray for Steve's mom now in a facility and going through a difficult time. We pray that you would grant her comfort. We pray that you would grant her peace. We pray that you would surround her with your love and your care. We continue to pray for Gail St. Clair as she recovers from her surgery. Thank you that she's doing so well. Thank you for friends and loved ones who are caring for her. Bless each one. We pray for Dave's friend, Carrie, having serious health issues. You know everything about him. We ask that you would bless Carrie, grant wellness, grant that treatment would be effective for Carrie's well-being. We pray for Gary, Judy Bishop's dad out in Wisconsin, thank you that he is rapidly recovering from his heart surgery. Continue to protect him from infection. Continue to bless his recovery and his healing. Give him strength. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Kevin's cousin Michael and his drastic improvement after open heart surgery. Thank you for the rehab and the work they are doing with him and that he is walking and he is speaking. Continue to bless his recovery, we pray. For Mary Lou in Vermont, we ask that you would continue to give her your comfort and your peace. Pray that you would surround her with your love and your care. Be with George Sirikis as he begins a new treatment this week. We ask that you would bless it to him. It would be effective for his health and well-being. Continue, we pray, to bless him. We pray for Danny's dad, George. Pray that you might continue to bless him, grant him strength, grant him your comfort, grant him a sense of your presence and encourage his very heart and spirit, we would pray today. Father, we remember those in recovery who meet here. Many are actually coming to faith in the true higher power, Jesus Christ. That would be our prayer that 
not only would they find sobriety, but they would find the true higher power who loves all people and is the key to recovery. Be with our nation and grant great spiritual renewal, we pray. Thank you for what you're doing on in bringing revival to many college campuses, though it may be overshadowed by other things. Continue your mighty work changing the hearts of people of every age, of every walk of life, for each one is precious in your sight. Father, we worship you today by praying as our master Jesus taught his disciples to pray, whose father, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you would like to turn to it, on page 685 in the Bible, in the chair in front of you, page 685, if you're using that specific Bible, we are going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 15 today, if you're using your your phone like I usually do when I'm at home. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20 is going to be our passage today, page 685, Matthew 7, beginning at verse 15. We'll read it in just a moment, but first I want to tell you about Evan Edwards. Do you know that name? Evan Edwards was on the run. He took off with his family in his Mercedes-Benz on July 1st, 2022. They took off because the FBI was after them. The FBI was seeking Evan Edwards. Six weeks later, the Florida State Police scanned his plate, realized he was wanted, pulled him over. He had his family in that Mercedes on the side of the highway. They searched his car because of the charges against him. He had a he had a Faraday bag. I never heard of that until I read this story. But if the FBI is ever after you, you take any electronic devices, put it in a Faraday bag, and it, they can't track you. They can, you can't get your email, your texts or emails either. But they had a Faraday bag with all their electronic devices, so nobody would know where they are. They had shredded documents. They had a laser printer, and they had a a Department of Justice book on how money can be traced through financial institutions, therefore you can do your financial stuff without being traced. Evan Edwards, his wife and children were being followed by the FBI because they were wanted for fraud. They had had a retired accountant with Alzheimer's sign the form to help them secure $8 million in that, remember that COVID relief money? They had got $8 million to make payroll for 479 employees for their ministry, Aslan International except it didn't exist and there were no employees. The FBI believed that they had set themselves up. They were, they were missionaries to Turkey. Evan Edwards was a missionary to Turkey and had set himself up to go back to Turkey with his family where the $8 million would be more than enough to live on for the rest of their lives in luxury. And there on the side of the highway, Evan Edwards and his son were arrested and the case is ongoing. What a shock it was to the church they were the interim leaders of as missionaries who would come back from Turkey. Well, the latest thing across America is scam emails from your pastor saying, can you go to the store and get some gift cards and keep it quiet just between us. I will never ask that of you. I will never ask that of you unless, unless I'm desperate. <laughs> then there are lottery scams. You get an email or you get a text saying or a phone call, you won money. 
You won money from this lottery. All you have to do is send us a few thousand dollars and that will secure the process so that you can begin receiving your lottery winnings from some lottery you've never even played. There are IRS scams. You owe such and such an amount to the IRS. The IRS will never call you. They don't even answer the phone, never mind call you. But IRS scams, you owe a certain amount. Please send it. There are your grandchild or your child were arrested scams. You might even have a young person call and say, Grammy, Grandpa, or Dad, Mom, I've been arrested. Can you send bail money? Every one of those scams has found a victim in Union Church, by the way. But back to the pastor on the run, Jesus warned us to be prepared for spiritual scammers as leaders in the church. We've been working our way and we're almost at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is speaking of what it means to be a genuine disciple of Jesus, one who not only claims his sacrifice on the cross and the benefits of forgiveness of sin and life eternal, but a genuine disciple, John Stott said, a radical disciple who listens to what Jesus actually said and applies it to self and how we live and how we seek to live our life versus others who claim the benefit of Jesus and proclaim his name, but never actually listen to what he actually said and don't live in line with what he taught. There are real Christians and false Christians. And in today's passage, there's a warning. There are genuine shepherds who are seeking to be obedient to Jesus by mimicking him and repeating his words. And then there are those who are not sincere. And this is the warning that Jesus gives us today. Jesus says, to his body, be narrow gate Christians, those who enter by the narrow gate, verse 12, by listening to what he says, not those who enter the broad road, verses 13 and 14 of Matthew 7, which leads to destruction, and he warns his sheep about false shepherds. And I'm going to read today from our passage, Luke, Matthew Seven. Where did Luke come from? Beginning at verse 15. And this passage is more applicable in our day than in any other time in all of church history, I think. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So Jesus gives a warning to his church. He's the only true shepherd. There are no other shepherds, only under shepherds, seeking to teach his word. As the only true shepherd, he's watching out for his church. It is his church, no one else's. And he warns us here, false leaders or teachers will be a reality in every place, in every century. False teachers or leaders in the church will be a reality, sometimes right in front of us, and he warns us so that we will not be deceived. Real discipleship is a disciplined life. It's a life, again, of adhering to the teaching of Jesus, listening to what he actually said, which is why we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount to see what was on the heart of Jesus and what his values actually were as opposed to so many that are not really uh, his values as represented by some who claim to be part of his church. A false teacher will 
always alter the teaching of Jesus. They'll often say he's not really God in human form, or they may alter some aspect of his teaching in some other way. They'll say, for instance, God will bless you financially if you give to my ministry. He'll return your money to you a hundredfold if you will give a seed of faith to my ministry. Biblical? No, we give sacrificially what God places on our heart to give. God will bless that and will bless our life as we obey him but he's not going to multiply our money back to us, and we're not obligated to give. We give sacrificially and not expecting anything in return. Often in the sexual area, they will not personally live the teaching of the apostles and of Jesus, and not by their teaching uphold what the narrow way actually is. And there's many, a lot of teaching on that, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Matthew chapter 5, lust in the heart and so on that we've gone over even in the Sermon on the Mount. Many false teachers are sexual predators who will prey on people and are anything but pure of heart, which is what Jesus calls every Christian to, not just leaders, but certainly every leader should be pure of heart in their motives and conduct. False leaders are a reality in the world in which we live. In the world around us, there are all sorts of deceivers misleading sometimes millions of people, but they're also in the church. Do you know that Target is now putting cameras on self-checkout or in some stores eliminating self-checkout? Many stores are no longer allowing us to check out. We didn't used to do it, now we've been doing it, now they're taking it away again. Why? Because we have a national character crisis. America is so full of people who are dishonest, we are dishonest and won't even pay for our own groceries or household items. So many stores are taking away uh, self-checkout, false behavior, false leaders are in the world around us, but they're also in the Church of Christ. A.W. Tozer said wisely, if you see all the Christians running after someone, run in the other direction. Don't follow the crowd. Be careful to listen to Jesus and what he said. And false teachers will look like good leaders. They will appear to be and speak like genuine disciples of Christ. They will know Christianese, the language of the Bible and the language of the church. But inwardly, Jesus says, inwardly, they will be hungry, greedily devouring wolves. And the word there that is translated devouring in the NIV is means greedily tearing apart another living thing to eat it. A hungry wo dog wolfing down at supper comes to mind as the analogy there. And the church of Christ and the individual Christian are the one being consumed. Jesus warns us. Jesus says, be discerning, be wise, be careful who you listen to, be careful who you support. He warns us, it happens everywhere. One of the first men who mentored me when I became a new Christian turned out to be a pedophile, preying on boys. And when it was revealed, people didn't even believe it because they'd known the person so long it just couldn't be true. A pastor I used to visit when I was in college had a similar sin, sexual area. A famous Christian speaker assaulted women when he when it first came out he denied it he had a woman sign an an nda and paid her off guilty people don't pay people off he paid her off and still people did not believe that he was actually guilty of this until he died and then many women came forward when I was a young man, the People's Temple killed 900 people. Jim Jones, the leader of the group, 
was a former Church of the Nazarene pastor. David Berg, head of the Children of God, which has a diff the forever family now, they, they're called. David Berg came out of my old denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance. His parents were missionaries in West Virginia. David Koresh, Charles Taze Russell, founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, all came out of biblical churches. Jesus said, they'll be right among you, like devouring wolves. He didn't say, follow what feels good or follow what appeals to you. He said, follow me. Follow me, Jesus. He didn't say, follow the crowd or follow people. Even Christian leaders we should not follow. Ultimately, we follow only Jesus. Follow me, said Jesus. Listen to my word. The Father came down at the baptism of Jesus and said, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Listen to him, to his word. We want to hear him. We want to be the disciple over here who listens to what Jesus actually said and taught and his values. And if all the world says the opposite, Jesus is still the one we will listen to and follow and no one else. So Jesus is warning us in this passage, false leaders will come. Don't be gullible. Don't be immature. Be grown and wise in Christ. James said, do not be unstable going this way and that, following trends. We don't need trends. We follow Jesus who has stood in one place forever. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he is the one we follow and listen to. And the apostles in the New Testament are repeating his teaching. So we hear and listen to the Holy Spirit guided apostles who teach what Jesus taught, sometimes in greater detail, but they teach what Jesus taught. And we listen to that. And we seek to align our life, our person, our heart, our character, our beliefs to what Jesus and the apostles have taught and no one, no one else. Paul was leaving the church in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and in verse 29 he said, after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock, rising from among you they weren't from somewhere else, rising from among you, speaking perverse things to draw the disciples away. In Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, we're told there will be eloquent speakers who deceive. I'm so thankful I'm not eloquent. We don't need eloquence. We need truth. We don't need new information that someone got from a vision. We need what the scripture is already teaching. We don't need charisma. We need the word of God and what Jesus has actually said. Well, Jesus warns us that this will happen, that there will be such people who will be leaders in the church. And then he, he answers our next question, which is, <laughs> there's, a, there's a strong man. And Brian, we want you to redo that in about 20 years. <laughs> what a beautiful family. We're blessed. The second question we might ask is, how will we know these people? How will we know false teachers and leaders when they appear? And the last verse is the capstone of what Jesus, the analogy that Jesus uses, like we know a tree by its leaves or its fruit, we will know them by their fruit. By their fruit, you will know the false leader or teacher. Have they been immoral? Have they violated God's standard in a way? A violation is a classic sign of a false leader or teacher. Good trees produce what? Good fruit. What are the good fruits that we would look for in any Christian, including a leader? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, forgiveness. A teacher or leader sent by God will call us to seek God's way and will seek to role model as 
as well as humanly possible. The things that are taught by Jesus and taught by the apostles. No person is perfect, but will resemble what is said in the pages of scripture. Loving the word, honest and upright, not lying, not deceptive. In Titus, and if you'd like to turn to that, I'd be thrilled. In Titus, it's page 844 if you want to turn to it or bring it up on your phone. Titus chapter 1 gives, is one of the places that gives a description of how the leader in the church of Christ ought to be. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. God bless you guys. Paul writes, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And he means he or she. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught meaning the teaching of the apostles and Jesus, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. The leader, the teacher, the person we ought to listen to is striving after godliness. We would sum it up in that way, resembling these characteristics. And in verses 10 and 11, we're warned about what a false shepherd or false leader or teacher will be like, there are many rebellious people, talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. That was a, an issue back in the first century. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things that they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain, divisiveness is a sign of a false teacher. So anyone not of God, contrary to the description given in the first part of the passage, will be rebellious, an empty talker, proud, not truthful, not sound, upsetting whole families, erratic, proud, self-centered, not truthful. I was taught years ago to look at people, even people I know, as, as if they were strangers and ask myself, does their behavior, I'm used to them, they're right, right here near me, but does their behavior have fruit coming out of their life that is godly and is, is in keeping with what the scripture is teaching? Are they bearing godly fruit? What fruit comes out of our lives? But if it's a church leader, a pastor, do they love the word of God and love to be in it and love to teach it and share it with others? And do they live by it and apply it to themselves? Are they moral? Not making off-color jokes or comments. Are they kind? Are they genuine? Are they caring? Are they humble and willing to admit they make errors or mistakes just like anyone else? Willing to admit imperfection? Does the ministry or church produce true followers of Christ who are the same and are seeking to be the people who listen to Jesus and what he actually said? A visiting pastor visited a large church with a well-known pastor one time visited the staff, went into the staff meeting with a friend and the staff was meeting in a large conference room all around a big table and the, the, the normal, the pastor of the church was there sitting at the end of the table, the well-known guy, the visiting pastor just sat elsewhere and people were arriving and they were chatting and so on and 
in the course of it, the pastor of the church, the large church, made a, a comment and joke about the bodies of two women at the table who worked in the church. And everybody laughed, except the visiting pastor who was shocked by what he just heard out of the mouth of the, the pastor of the church. He, after the meeting, asked his friend on staff about it, and his friend said, oh, the pastor always jokes that way. He doesn't mean anything. He's just having fun. He's a godly man. The visiting pastor said, no, godly, godly men don't talk that way. Within a year, the pastor of that church who had made the off-color joke had resigned after several women came forward saying he had sexually harassed them. Good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. We know a true or false leader, teacher, shepherd by the fruit coming out of their life and out of their work. Jesus gave us that standard, an easy-to-remember standard to go by. This is how you'll know them, said Jesus. The nature, the character, the reliability of the leader, the person claiming to be teaching the scripture, claiming to be serving Christ, does their fruit weigh in and, and match what the scripture is saying, what Titus said, what it says in Timothy as well. We can objectively step back and review the life of a leader or a teacher and say, I know this person, I love this person. Does their life add up to what? Are they seeking to be that godly person? We should ex objectively examine their fruit. Is it godly? Is it not? If not, right before us, on our television, on our computer, maybe in a church, we may have a false shepherd, a false leader on our hands. Jesus says it happens. It's common. It will happen again and again. Be aware. Be discerning. Remember me, your true shepherd, and what I'm like. And does the under-shepherd seek to be like me with sincerity? And remember, good fruit will produce, good trees will produce good fruit. That's how you will know a true person seeking to lead the church in a godly manner. And then he finishes with a warning in verse 19. He finishes with a warning there. He says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. False prophets, false teachers, people who trifle with the word of God will one day be re very regretful because they will be judged by God is what he is saying, what Jesus is saying by that analogy of a tree cut down and thrown into the fire. Touch the word of God in the wrong way and you are invoking very serious, blasphemous things. Revelation 20, verse 12 says, John saw the vision of heaven in the end times. He said, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne of the Lamb, meaning on the day of judgment. The scripture says elsewhere it is appointed that a man once shall die, and then comes judgment. False prophets, whether in this world or in the world to come, will pay a consequence for tampering with the body of Christ, misleading people who are seeking to follow Christ, or tampering with the word of God itself. Have you ever heard of T.B. Joshua? I never heard of him, but T.B. Joshua had the largest YouTube ministry in the whole world. He's the leader of a mega church out of Nigeria, and he professed to be an apostle of God. That's an office that ended in the first century with the death of John. But he says, I am an apostle of God and I receive divine revelation. God tells me things that aren't in the scripture. He said, that's how I know Hillary Clinton will win the 2016 election. He said, I can touch people and cure the Ebola virus that was a scourge in Africa. 
He said, my word given by God, my word will stop the COVID epidemic worldwide. He had people who would stand up and claim that he cured their cancer. Celebrities came from all over Africa, but the U.S. also, and claimed various deliverances of various ways. T.B. Joshua said, I predicted that. Remember that marathon bombing in a place called Boston? He said, I predicted that. Over here on the side, hundreds of rape victims came forward. Women and children who said, T.B. Joshua sexually molested and raped me for many years. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but on June 5th, 2021, so-called Pastor T.B. Joshua, so-called apostle, completed that YouTube broadcast that had the biggest audience in the entire world. And there in the studio in his church, he stood up and he said, that was God's work today. And he fell over dead. He had no signs of health issues. He was 58 years old. Could be a coincidence. But Jesus said, a false teacher is like a tree cut up as useless and thrown into the fire. It won't end well for false prophets. It didn't for David Koresh. He went up in flames. Jim Jones did not end well. The purple Nike guy with a UFO. Things did not end well. We have them in, the, in other worlds, the political world, the government world. Stalin, Joseph Stalin, studied at seminary as a young man, later claimed that God had appointed him to restore Russia. Hitler claimed the same. It didn't end well. Stalin died shaking his fist at heaven, shook his fist at heaven. His daughter Maria was there. She was so shaken by seeing her father die, he fell back dead. She became a Christian. She was so shaken by what she saw at the deathbed of her father, Joseph Stalin, appointed by God. Beware of who claims to be God's man or woman. Beware. Does their fruit equal what Jesus actually said and taught? If not, step back, step away, walk away. If it isn't godly, walk away. Their fate will not go well, those who trifle with the word of God. Don't get sucked in by their wake. Who do we follow? One. One being, one person, Jesus. Who do we follow? Only Jesus and what he said. And if all the world says this and Jesus says this, we run in this direction as hard as we can and follow only him. There will be false prophets. You will know them by their fruit. Don't tag along with them because their end will not go well. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, For the time will come when people will not abide by sound doctrine, but to suit their own purposes, they will gather around a number of teachers to hear what their itching ears want to hear. Let's not be among them. Only Jesus, shall we pray. Father, thank you that you sent into our world a sinless, perfect, all-wise, all-powerful being as a human to role model who we want to be, whether man or woman or child. We want to be him, like him, of his holy character, of his holy choices, of his following and teaching applied to us. Father, may we who are gathered here, may this church, may your church around the world not be misled, but hear what you have actually said and what your values actually are and follow you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
We do have communion this morning, so we're going to sing a hymn of communion, then we'll celebrate it together, then we will sing and be dismissed. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. celebrate communion together we celebrate the Son of God coming into the world out of love for all humanity and living a sinless life then giving his life in exchange for ours by paying paying for our sin on the cross but we celebrate also that he does so much more and I want to reread the passage that we read at prayer time which is about Jesus. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, and bestow on them a crown of beauty. He came into the world to give his life on the cross for our sin, and to take our sin on him who was holy. His sinlessness, his holiness transferred to us when we trust in him as our savior, and yet he does so much more he preaches the good news to the poor. He is with those who are suffering due to poverty. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. When we, have you ever been brokenhearted? He's the one to run to. I've been there, and he, was a, he will bind up those who are brokenhearted. Freedom from whatever is binding us. Freedom for the captives. To proclaim the year of his favor, he gives good things to those who trust in him, and he will comfort all who mourn. So we celebrate at communion the giving of Jesus' life on the cross, but also his great love and his great work to assist us in this fallen world. Could we take a moment, as we customarily do, to pray between ourselves and him, giving thanks before him. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you gave your life for our sin on the cross. As we partake of these elements now, we give you thanks, remembering not only what you did on the cross for us, but what you continue to do as you minister to us in the moments of grief, in the moments of trial, never leaving us. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is my blood poured out in a new covenant for you. Drink this in remembrance of me.
Thank you to all of you who have joined us on live stream from wherever you are. God loves you and he is wherever you may be.